Um, so hello, good morning. I'm Jesse Cook. I'm working with Thunderbolt Labs, and uh, I'm here to talk about maglev. Uh, I'm a little nervous, so if I throw up like that guy, just <laughs> take pictures and tweet to Ruby friends. Um, that'll make me feel a lot better. You point and laugh also. Uh, so there's this guy, Avi Bryant, and back in 2006, before, or sorry, in 2007, before RailsConf, he wrote this really cool uh, article called Ruby and Other Gems. And in it, he talked about this uh, small talk product called Gemstone, which I had never heard of. Um, and he likened it to Rails. What he said was that Rails is this framework that does all this kind of cool persistent stuff. But there are these other products out there, um, specifically Gemstone, that do a lot of this stuff for you. Um, of course, my slide is kind of cut off. So as he, he compared basically the storage engine, um, the memory cache, and the worker processes, um, and likened how we use you know, a relational database to store objects. Um, we might use like memcached back then, or Redis nowadays to do some type of uh, um, uh, shared memory um, caching. And then we have our actual app servers. And uh, he thought that it would be really interesting to try to get this working in Ruby. Um, and so uh, he ends his, art, his little blog post saying, so there you have it, Gemstone, it's like Rails, but faster and easier, if only it ran Ruby. And this sparked a really interesting conversation uh, that ended up with this product called Maglev, which I'm here to talk about today. So what is Maglev? Maglev is a Ruby implementation, um, just like there's MRI, Rubinius, JRuby. Uh, Mac Ruby, but it is built on top of a Smalltalk product called uh, Gemstone S. And uh, Gemstone, the company, has been around for 30 some years now. Gemstone S has been around for 20, 25, almost 30 years. Uh, it's a very solid product, and it offers some really interesting features that uh, make um, our lives as Rubyists a lot easier in terms of uh, persisting our objects. And there are some other really cool things inside of Maglev itself that uh, I hope to talk about today. Uh, so Gemstone S, the product, is uh, basically a Smalltalk VM that has a built-in object database. Um, and it's uh, uh, used in, in mission-critical applications all across the world. Uh, UBS uses it, um, Jack in the Box uses it, which I think is mission critical. Um, uh, OOCL, a shipping container company, uses it to manage all of their uh, shipping containers, millions of shipping containers worldwide. Um, but the, the reason why uh, I think it's so special uh, is it has this thing built in called transparent object persistence, and that's the object database that's um, available via the Smalltalk uh, product. So there's this great quote um, by Avdi Grimm. He was uh, one of the rogues, and he said, I've often wished that I could just do something where I just change a bunch of models, and at the end of the request cycle, something magical happens, some, some, something magical goes through and collects up all the models that I have changed and persists them. And I haven't really gotten to that level yet. Sometimes I feel like Active Record is holding me back from that. Of course, he's talking about a typical Rails app. This was on a Ruby Rogues episode with uh, David Larrabee talking about domain-driven design. And uh, David chimed in with a punchline, well, you can have that, you just have to switch to Java or .NET. And I was driving and that made me really sad um, because that's not actually true. We've, um, we've had this awesome Maglev product, but it doesn't quite have a, a lot of knowledge or adoption yet. So. Um, the other interesting thing is right after I heard that, as I was driving up to Seattle, I uh, was passed by an OOCL truck. Um, so they are all over the place. It's uh, pretty neat. So gemstones everywhere. They, they, uh, it's a, a, a great product. So, um, sorry, the P is cut off. Um, the thing that we deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is basically that uh, persisting objects is hard. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to the relational model, um, there's, uh, and I'll talk about a little bit, an impedance mismatch between what we have in our 
uh, Ruby application and then how we store our data. And the, um, you know, relational databases do a very good job of this. Um, you know, people use the document databases, people use Redis, all sorts of uh, um, cool products, but um, to an extent it starts to fall apart. Um, you have to split up your data. You have to have parts of your data stored over here. And we all, we all know this, right? We all build applications. We use Postgres or MySQL or whatever. Um, but with Maglev, you don't have to do that because your objects, um, as you design them in your Ruby application, can be persisted and used anywhere. Um, so persistence in OO, uh, going back to Smalltalk, was supposed to be simple. Um, it basically was something you didn't have to think about. You could create objects in your running program, and then uh, you could close your program, and you could open your program back up, and your objects would still be there. Um, it seemed like a really nice world to live in. Um, and so, you know, Smalltalk has that, and that seems to be fantastic. And it's, it's uh, enabled by this thing called the image, and that's basically how I think of this kind of like fusion plasma ball where you have all your objects floating around, um, and they can, all their relations and everything is just connected. So uh, currently, you know, as I said, we store objects as rows um, in databases, uh, you know, relational. Uh, maybe we store them as documents in something like Mongo or React um, as they're marshaled to some other data format, or even as strings in, in Redis. Um, which is kind of a, um, a, little, a little bit of a shame because we're ripping apart our objects um, and we're ripping apart the relations. Um, and I think from a, um, uh, a holistic point of view, that's kind of a mean thing to do to your objects. Um, but we have to for most, most of the things we want to get done. Um, but the other thing that it does is there's kind of a, a, a shift in the way we have to think about um, retrieving our objects even. So, you know, we have the, the typical find by name, finder in Rails, um, or we, uh, the user create is a, is a bit more simple. But, you know, this is basically uh, the API that we use to talk to our database. But it gets thrown down into some query language that's transferred across the wire via strings, um, which is a pretty primitive um, way to uh, talk about this rich world that we live in with objects. Um, and the other thing that happens with uh, these other storage systems is that they start leaking into our code. And so you can think of SQL as being like a, uh, the leaky abstraction with object-oriented programming, where you have finders um, that are, you know, need valid SQL in order to um, find the things that you, that you need to find. So, uh, one of the, the terms that really bugs me is PORO, plain old Ruby object. Um, and that's one of the things that we kind of tend not to deal with too much um, uh, in, our, in like a typical Rails app, let's say, because um, uh, what developers usually think about is the, the storage mechanism. Um, and so, you know, it's not that I have a post and a post is just a normal class, it's that a post is an active record object. Uh, and in order to, um, solve a bunch of problems, or to um, avoid a bunch of problems, you have to generally think about um, uh, the object as an instance of an active record object, not as just a plain old Ruby object. Um, so this kind of uh, speaks to the object relational impedance mismatch, which is this fancy term for, um, you know, you've got your objects over here, and then you have the way to store them uh, over, over there. And over there could be who knows where, right? Like, it's kind of nice that it's a bit of a black box, but it's only a black box to an extent. There's, um, you know, you still have to, to, to know enough about it. And there's really, um, there's some great articles, you know, the, the Cunningham and Cunningham, the C2 wiki, is a fantastic resource to read more about this. Um, so, getting back to Avi. Um, back in 2007, he gave the keynote at RailsConf, and uh, he was kind of talking about this gemstone product a little bit, and uh, he said, you know, the future of Ruby is here, it's just that we have it over in the small talk world, and you guys should come and get it. And he was mainly talking about um, having a fast VM and having 
um, a nice persistence model that you essentially don't really have to think about. Um, and so we have that with maglev. Um, so I'll kind of start with a, uh, a simple example to show you um, what it's like to work with maglev. Um, so first, um, let me kill this for a second. So maglev is a, um, a Ruby implementation. Right now it's uh, 187, it's targeting 187. Um, there's a team working um, in Germany to get it up to uh, 193 and then hopefully Ruby 2.0 soon. Um, uh, but it's, um, it's basically Ruby, except it's got what you could think of as an object database built into it. So I'll go through some examples to hopefully get you a little familiar with um, what it's like to work with maglev. So the first thing is um, there's, this, there's this notion of a persistent root. And um, make sure I don't get too close. So the persistent root is uh, where you want to stick anything that you want to persist. Um, and so what I mean by that is, let's say I've got a class um, and I create uh, an instance of the class, uh, my cat Pierre. Now I go through and I kind of add, the, persistence, the persistent root is essentially kind of like a, a hash, um, or actually it is a hash. Um, and so when I add Pierre um, into the hash, and then I run this thing, uh, commit transaction, um, my, the, the instance is just basically magically saved, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that happens on the back end. Um, the VM uh, um, stores it in memory, but then it also takes a, um, a representation, the, the same representation that's in memory, and it writes it to disk. Um, and then this is available in any other instance of uh, maglev that you boot up. So uh, let, me, let me say that again. So I can persist uh, an object in one running VM, and then I can pull it up and have that in the same instance of the object in another VM. I don't have to go out to a database. Um, it's just there. Um, and so you can see that here. Uh, basically, you know, I, this little example is me just showing you that uh, um, pulling up another VM. Oh, and by the way, I call it pROOT because having persistent root everywhere is kind of long. Um, so it's a very simple mechanism, and that's what's really nice about it. Um, it's very easy to understand. There's no save. Um, there's, there's not necessarily any validations, though there could be. Um, it's just this very simple notion of transactions. So uh, the maglev VM, the, the gemstone VM, basically has two modes. It has the default transient mode and um, a persistent mode. And so the transient mode, basically, uh, being the default means that when you start running it, any instance that you um, create, won't it won't be necessarily saved um, to the stone, which is kind of the, the database um, that everything shares. Um, and so what I mean by that is you can still um, have things kind of local to the VM, but there's still, um, it, it won't be saved off and then available at, to other VMs that connect. So you can run in a persistent mode, and the persistent mode actually um, um, allows you to uh, essentially save like whatever um, it, it, they both start what's like a, a transaction, so maglev is transaction based, um, but uh, the persistent mode basically wraps your whole program in this uh, persistent block, and uh, anything that's um, um, required, any classes that are defined, are then, uh, um, you're able to persist them. Uh, so transactions, right? So. Uh, Transactions are, are pretty simple to understand. You begin a transaction, you uh, might abort a transaction if you don't want the stuff anymore, and then you commit a transaction. So, uh, in kind of a, a simple way to uh, think about persistence. Um, so when you start up a maglev VM, there's an implicit uh, begin transaction. Um, uh, if you want to throw things away and start over, you can abort a transaction. Uh, and what that does, both begin transaction and abort transactions, kind of grab a fresh view, which I'll explain uh, in a second. Um, 
So Maglev works by having this gemstone VM um, kind of running wherever. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter where it's running. Um, and then in the gemstone parlance, but we'll call it, they, they call them gems, which is a running instance, um, which is the, the little blocks at the bottom. Um, so what happens is when you abort a transaction, um, the running gemstone, or sorry, the running uh, Ruby program essentially grabs a fresh copy from the stone. So anything that has changed in any other VM is then available locally to your VM, to your uh, gem. So you get uh, essentially like a snapshot of the database. And uh, on the flip side, when you commit the transaction, um, things are basically pushed back up to the stone. Um, so it's a, it's a it's, you know, there's, there's um, it's kind of like, you know, active record save to an extent. Um, but it happens across anything that's changed in your, in your program since the last time you aborted. So one thing that uh, Gemstone has that's really powerful is what's called persistence by reachability. And uh, as the example kind of shows, which I'll explain, um, is that basically you don't have to stick everything into that persistent root. Um, anything that is inside the persistent root Anything that is attached to something that's inside the persistent root can be persistent. Um, so the example here is that I have an array. Um, oh, and by the way, all like the like normal classes like strings, um, arrays, hashes, those things are all persistible kind of by default. You don't have to do anything special with those. Um, so I have you know an array, and I put an instance of a cat in it, and I'm actually persisting the array. I'm not persisting. Um, the, the instance of the cat itself. And when I start up another VM, um, I can pull that out and it's the same object. So notice I'm actually comparing the instance of the cat that's in the array, not the two arrays. So that's essentially persistence by reachability. And it goes all the way down the graph, right? So if my cat Pierre has uh, an array or whatever of toys, um, and I append um, a ball of yarn to it, when I go to get that back out later, it is the same object. So it's the, they're the same objects all the way down the graph. So what are things we can easily persist today uh, with you know, Active Record or any type of ORM? We've got arrays, uh, lists essentially, we have um, sets, which is basically an array with some type of um, constraint on it. Um, hashes, either with like a Redis or um, you know Mongo or HStore or whatever. Uh, and then counters, which get a little tricky because you've you know you might have to do some locking if you're using a relational or um, you know use something like Redis. But these are all things that we uh, have in Ruby, yet we have to translate out into our um, uh, data store, and also sorted sets, um, which is you know something that I've used in Redis several times, and it's a it's a wonderful feature. Um, but the common theme among all of these is uh, I have to uh, manage serialization somehow. Um, it's more expensive than dealing with just the objects themselves because I have to decompose the object, um, put it in some type of form that I send across to something else um, or get back from something else and then build up the object again. Um, and I may want to uh, use some other type of data structure that is more exotic than um, you know, an array. So something like a, a KD tree if you're doing some type of mapping program. Yeah, <laughs> guys, KD trees. Um, or uh, a bloom filter. Um, or a Judy array, or something that Google told me was a leftist tree. Um, um, so uh, the, the point that uh, I'm trying to make with this is that, going back to kind of the, the mismatch, is that it's not always just about our, the objects themselves, but it's about the relations. Um, and it's the, it's the graph that we build up. Like, that's the, that's the fun part of, uh, 
uh, programming. That's the part that you know um, gets me going, and that you know you kind of design these systems and you you uh, design the way that components interact with each other. Um, so closure, right? Closure is kind of like the new hotness, and and a lot of those guys tend to not necessarily agree with uh, a lot of the ways that we do things over in the OO world. Um, but there was this uh, really interesting talk that. Um, I'm blanking on his name and my notes aren't working, um, that one of the guys at Relevance did about uh, closure um, called the impedance mismatch is our fault. Um, and uh, the, one, the one nice thing he had to say about OO was essentially transactions, that transactions are awesome. And so if you think about the way you normally do, um, you know, your Rails app or your, uh, um, you know, your, your Ruby script, whatever, your Sinatra app, um, you're not really using transactions. Like, it's a very uh, simple way to think about um, uh, persisting data. And so uh, I thought that this was a, a really interesting quote. So the only nice thing I'll say about databases as they exist today, or about Java or other OO languages, the only nice thing I'll say is about transactions. Transactions are awesome. Transactions are composable. We can understand how to reason about them, which is very important, and they're part of what give databases their greatness. So I've got no qualm with transactions. And I thought this was really interesting because I talked to some of the implementers of Maglev, um, and uh, I was talking with them about um, Datomic, the new kind of closure uh, database. Fa they use like fax and kind of stores every, like the state. Um, and Gemstone has, basically done that for a really long time. Like you may not be able to go back and get all of the history um, at each commit, but it's basically uh, something that they you know, did 20, 30 years ago um, that's now making its way out to uh, other languages, which is, which is great. Um, but I would like to see people kind of also use that in Ruby. Um, so uh, we'll run through another quick example. Um, there's the, the kind of the typical blog example um, in, in the Rails world. And um, what was really fun about this, it's just a simple Sinatra app, but I was just dealing with classes. Like I didn't have any migrations. I didn't have to set up like SQLite or Postgres. Um, there were no dependencies. Um, so there were no drivers. Um, as long as like Maglev installs, like you will be able to persist your objects. Um, which can be really fun to, um, to use. So uh, yeah, so this very simple um, Sinatra app, you know, I basically load up posts and blogs. Um, if I wanna get a post, I just use an actual detect, right? Like I'm not, I'm not doing like a find by or using find ID or anything. Like I'm not having to necessarily worry about um, um, you know, the representation out in the other world. Like I just wanna find just like I would in any other like typical Ruby program. Uh, on the create side, um, it's very simple, right? Like I just create and then I append the post to the, the uh, list of blog posts. Um, do some redirect and like that's essentially it. But what enables this is kind of uh, going back to what Avdi um, had asked for, which was something that kind of magically collected up all the changes and uh, persisted them. And so if we, uh, this is something that um, uh, Peter on the Maglev team had kind of whipped up. It's a basic rack middleware. Um, and so uh, if you think about the request response lifecycle, like you can uh, abort on the way in, and then um, you want to figure out if you uh, at the end where this kind of commit if cool um, method. Basically on the status, like, you know, we want to figure out how we're gonna, uh, sorry, if we're going to uh, commit the changes that have happened in this request. And the commit if cool basically says, well, if the status is like something that's like relatively successful, uh, then commit, otherwise abort. And like that's, that's it, right? Any changes that have been made are persisted and uh, any other VM that connects will see that, and uh, it's a very simple paradigm. Um, and then I'll kind of whip through these, they're not really that important, but basically my um, classes were uh, just normal Ruby classes, right? Like the, 
um, initializing the, the blog itself, like I'm just dealing with normal arrays. Um, the post, you know, um, I've got like just, it's all just normal, just normal Ruby. Um, the author is just a normal class. Um, and uh, it's really easy to kind of get going with it, right? So um, if I have like what I call a, a bootstrap script, I can uh, load the classes inside a persistent block and um, I can set things up and then I basically just commit. So there's this kind of dash m commit thing, um, which is the same thing as saying maglev commit at the end of the script. And that's it, like objects are created and they will stick around until you delete them. Um, and after I gave, I, so I set up, I kind of did this example um, for Cascadia Ruby, and I whipped this thing up like in the morning. I thought it'd, it'd be a nice little demo. I made the objects. I wanted to make sure it worked, right? It's like, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, like I was kind of poking around in my, in my uh, maglev, lo uh, looking around the persistent root, and like there were my, uh, there was my blog. And there was like the post that I, the example post I'd put in there. Um, and what, what kind of struck me was that they were, they were the objects themselves, like they were the instances. I didn't have to like, you know, my program contained them. I didn't have to go out and get them. Um, so it was an interesting little um, realization that that was a very, it was very pleasant. It was um, kind of a nice way to interact with my program. Um, so another example that I've uh, talked about before is uh, something simple like a worker queue. Um, so we have these things, right? We've got Sidekick and Rescue, and, and those are like absolutely great libraries. Um, but you can write something very similar in like 35-ish lines of code. Um, so if you think about um, what these worker queues do, is basically you want to put something like a proc in, right? You want to be able to... to um, run like a call method or something, and the work will get done. Um, so uh, an example that you could use in um, something like maglev is that basically you can just you know, keep on adding jobs, right? Like let's just add jobs forever, and then we'll commit, and they'll be available to be pulled off this array at some point. But now the interesting thing to see here is that I'm persisting a proc. So procs aren't per, uh, you can't, mar technically you can marshal procs um, in other implementations, but uh, they, the implementers don't recommend you doing it. Um, so this is a, an interesting example because in maglev, you can persist any object. Like you can persist a proc if you want. Uh, you can persist threads through continuations, um, which people do uh, to debug things. Um, in small talk, and there's some examples in Ruby world, but um, they use continuations, and I don't understand those things. Um, so on the worker side, uh, you know, we've got basically this loop that aborts a transaction, so it grabs a fresh view of um, the repository. It, sh it pops off um, some unit of work to do. It immediately commits so that uh, that instance, that worker has that job and nobody else has that job, and then it calls it. So um, one thing I haven't talked about is like a commit failure. So what happens if two VMs try to pop off the same thing? Um, so Maglev has a notion of a, a, a failed commit exception. Um, but the retry logic is really simple. Like it's, for this is just redo. Like there's there's no there's there's no uh, other queue to manage. Um, it's you know just a, a one line change and like you're kind of good to go. Um, so on the worker side, you know we may have a, a failed transaction because. Um, uh, oh, sorry, this was what was this one? Oh, on the producer side. So maybe two VMs tried to uh, lock that queue array at the same time. Um, or sorry, append that queue array uh, at, at like exactly the same time. Um, and then on the worker side, you know, same thing with popping it off. So the, the, the code is up there, uh, but the point of this exercise 
was that it was like 34 lines, it might be a line or more or less now, um, but it was like 34 lines of, of Ruby code, just Ruby code. Um, no tests, of course, but it's pretty simple to understand. And so I was like, okay, well, like, what is that? You know, I had never used slow count before, and I was like, I just want to know how many lines of code it is, and I don't want to have to count them myself. And then he came out with this dollar amount. And I was like, well, first of all, 56 grand a year seems a little low. Um, so let's, let's assume we get, we get paid all right and we double that. Um, so this, you know, 776 bucks, let's say it's like two grand, right? It's like two grand to implement a, a, a distributed worker queue system in 35-ish lines of Ruby. Um, it's, a, it's a very powerful mechanism to have. So it shows that we can do very, um, what would be complex things very simply because we don't have to worry about our persistence model. Um, so uh, one of the other examples that I want to share is a, a leaderboard. Um, it's one of the things that Redis is uh, supposedly great, uh, great with. And um, I have some friends that I've, uh, um, I'll be using as examples. Um, but uh, um, essentially, you know, let's say the, the competition is the, um, you know, we want to get to 100 points. So I've got some users in my system and you know, me and Sprout are at 99, and Sean is at 98 points. Um, and the approaches that we can take to persist this on a, a you know, normal, like um, in any other Ruby implementation, would be to use something like Redis, um, so the, the sorted set, to come up with a way to use a relational database, um, or come up with some way to use like Ruby's sorted set, which um, contrary to popular belief, as I was flying here, um, I was watching a presentation. He was like, yeah, sorted sets, they're great. Ruby doesn't have that. It's not true, Ruby does have a sorted set. You require set, you'll get the sorted set. Like we have these data structures, so we don't necessarily have to go out to these um, other uh, systems to use them. So I was like, okay, for this instance, like let's use, let's use Redis. Uh, this, the sorted set seemed like a great tool to use for this application. Uh, but the problem I ran into was that um, two people could have a score of 100, but that doesn't mean that they both won. Like I had another, um, um, how, do you, how do you figure out if, you know, who won? Only one person can win this competition. Um, how do I know if it was me or how do I know if it was Sprout? Um, and so the idea um, in a normal, so kind of how you use that with uh, the spaceship operator um, would just be to simply compare their scores, right? Um, and this kind of, you know, gives us a, a nice simple way to compare to uh, leaderboard items. Um, but a better winner criteria is the first person to 100 points. Um, and I uh, um, actually contacted uh, Peter that works on Redis, and I was like, hey, like, is there a way to um, see who got to a certain number of points first. And unfortunately there wasn't, um, which kind of put a big damper on this new somewhat simple criteria. Um, because in Ruby, it's like just, you know, one more um, kind of set of, of um, comparisons, right? So first I see like two people are similar, uh, or sorry, first we compare on score. And then if the scores are the same, then we compare on the timestamp of the score. Um, and so using Redis, um, you know, the, the advantages were that it was always sorted on insert, which was great. Um, and Redis is super fast. Um, but the, the cons were that it only sorted on one score criteria, which was essentially like useless for, for this application when a new requirement came in. Um, and the Redis driver always returns an array. Um, it'd actually be kind of nice for, sort of, for sets if it did return an actual set, but it doesn't. Um, so you know, we could have done this with a relational database. Um, so one nice thing is that it can sort over any field. Um, so we could have gotten the score and the timestamp. Um, but, the, and, and it's relatively fast. You know, the, MySQL and Postgres are pretty quick. But um, the, the downsides are that it always sorts at query time. 
Um, so you are constantly figuring this thing out. Every time you request this, you're, you're figuring out uh, what, the, what the, the ranking is. And again, it returns this, um, I could make it return like a sorted set, but the driver itself just returns a list, um, which is not necessarily what I want to deal with. So the nice thing about using the sorted set in Ruby was that it was a richer data structure. Like it actually made sense to, to use this thing we already have. Um, it was composed of Ruby objects, like instances of the leaderboard item class, which was, which was really um, nice. Like, you know, Ruby's a programming language. It has objects, like let's use them. Um, it does sort on insertion. And um, I could sort over any criteria with the spaceship operator. Um, the only weird thing I found is that if things, depending on how you set it up, if you, you might have to sort before you iterate um, if you change things. But it was kind of a minor thing and um, not really that big a deal. <coughs> Performance-wise, like, it, it didn't matter. Um, so the moral of the story was that, um, you know, I was able to keep the logic, when I, when I did this, this uh, example, I was able to keep the logic in the app itself, like in my Ruby code. Um, I didn't have to... Uh, figure out what was going on in the database itself. And I was able to use data structures that we have in Ruby. Um, and if I didn't have exactly what I wanted, I could build them myself. Like, if, you know, Ruby's awesome, I'd build whatever I want. So if I wanted to build a data structure, I could use it. Um, the reason why I included this example is because with Maglev, it would have been absolutely trivial to do this and persist this across any number of um, you know, app servers um, or any, anything that could basically connect to the VM. Those things would already be there. The sorting would work. Everything would, would just work. Um, so the one thing that I really wanted to do, not like a live demo, but well, kind of a live demo, uh, and I, I heard that's risky. Um, so I didn't do it. But the, the, the fantastic thing about Maglev is that it's distributed. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I mean by that is, um, so if I have a stone um, running on this computer and I start up any number of those little gems, like you know, Maglev, Ruby, run some code, um, it will connect to this local machine and it will have all those objects. And that's cool. But where it's really powerful is when you distribute it over servers anywhere. So these objects, the stone is really smart about how it um, moves these objects around. And, and um, since the transaction approach is very simple, any computer that can connect to a stone um, can see the objects that it's allowed to see. Because there's all these crazy um, security policy things that you can do uh, in the VM. Um, and so what I wanted to do, and I didn't, um, was to get you all to help me with this um, because it's actually quite simple for you all to see what I have on my stone. Um, you basically, you know, use rake to kind of interface with maglev. Um, so you start up this thing called net LDI and then um, on the stone, so like this could be my slice up in, up in the cloud or whatever, um, you start Maglev, right? And so I have this object repository up there in the cloud, and as long as you can connect to it, um, you would be able to see objects, and you would be able to um, make changes and write new objects. And uh, so on my laptop, all I would really need to do is uh, start net LDI, which basically does like starts a daemon and then connects or make sure ports are set up and stuff. And oh, I totally forgot. Eh, that looks like crap. Um, anyway, so I would connect to the stone host, um, which would basically say, which would connect the maglev running on my laptop to maglev, the stone up wherever. And I would be able to see, um, which, sorry, it looks bad, the exact same objects. So that's what I mean by like a distributed um, object persistence. Um, you don't have to have like, Active record code over here, and active record code over here. You don't have to um, build up a gem as long as things are um, in both. Sorry, as, as long as the instances are persisted to the stone, they're available everywhere. Um, 
And so, you know, one would think that the killer feature of this is the transparent object persistence. But I maintain that it's the distributed transparent object persistence. Um, and that, that's what will allow people, when, they, when you start playing with this, to do some really interesting things much quicker, much uh, uh, easier than you would if you were to use you know, um, a relational database or some other data store. Uh, so Mott's talked about motivation, and uh, I'd like to share um, some motivation as to why you might want to play with Maglev. Um, so first of all, you will only ever deal with objects. You won't deal with rows. You won't deal with documents. You won't deal with like however Redis stores stuff. Um, I mean, it's keys, right? Essentially keys. Um, as or sorry, strings is keys, but uh, um, you will only deal with objects, and that's a really nice world to be in. Um, you get to learn from the past. Like, I'm just now learning how. Okay, small talk people are, of course, smart, right? But like, they've done so much, and they've, like, the history is so rich. We have um, so much to learn from them um, in terms of implementing, you know, VMs, which you know Rubinius did with its uh, C++ VM. Um, in terms of best practices. You know, all, all this kind of stuff. Like, it's, it's a really great way for us to become um, better programmers. And it makes your life easier. Like, you don't have to worry about, you know, like, is your database server down? Because with Maglev, either uh, your program runs or it doesn't. And if it doesn't run, that means it can't connect to the stone. And, like, that's really simple. Um, you don't have all these dependencies out there everywhere that you have to keep track of. Um, so I think I've only got a couple minutes left. I want to say um, uh, I'd love to actually try out the distributed thing on a larger scale. I've really only just tried the distributed thing like on my laptop, but I'd love to get a bunch of people together and see if we can't get it working um, on, a, on a little bit of a larger scale. So if you're interested in that, come find me. Um, I'll take questions if anybody has questions for a couple minutes. This is going to hurt, isn't it? Josh. Yeah, how, how do you deal with doing queries that, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, Jetstone has some capacity for doing SQL type queries. So if you're trying to do something, you want to, it's, it's like a relational type query mm -hmm. that would be better to grab just the right set of data from the stone rather than pulling, grabbing all the data and running through some Ruby thing. Yeah, I'm, I haven't looked into, um, so the question was, you know, does Gemstone have like this, or it does have this SQL type um, query language. I actually haven't really looked into that too much. Um, it does have uh, built-in indexing. Um, so if you're, uh, you can, if you're, I guess, worried about um, performance to an extent, like maybe you don't want to pull everything down. Um, I mean, everything pretty much comes down anyway. Like the VM handles most of that for you. Um, so it's kind of nice, you don't really have to think about it, but um, there's indexing stuff that's built in that helps with some of the performances of queries if you, if you need it. Uh, let's go with you your hand. Yeah, what can you tell us about um, sharding and large data sets and scalability and stuff like that? On okay, um, so sharding, there's no sharding um, because there's basically the stone. Um, there could be uh, some, I guess, it's so big that it doesn't fit on any piece of metal that exists today. Thank you. Um, so as long as you can like network attach storage, you can grow the size of your repository. So it's basically limited. The, the actual stone, the, num the, the number of objects is essentially unlimited. Uh, you can store whatever you want to store. What you may be able to have, um, like the VM will push stuff off to disk when necessary and it will pull stuff off of disk when it needs it. But uh, in terms of like s the number of objects you can store, it's unlimited because you just need more disk space. You basically tell the, the stone to like use another extent and it can grow. So as long as you have like network attached storage or some way to add capacity. That, that just sounds, what you're describing though sounds like for certain types of applications where you want to have a bunch of servers with like data in memory, because you just your data set is of such a nature that you can't really uh, you can't wait to swap. Like Google Search, for example, you know Google doesn't want to have to pull some data off of the disk in order to return search results to you. 
Yeah, so I don't think Google would use, would you, would, I mean, that's a, I guess that's a different problem for yeah. normal applications. Use something like this for something, maybe not exactly Google, but I mean something kind of like that. Sure. Um, so OOCL, like they've got a global network of offices. Um, people are creating objects all the time. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there are things deep down in the VM that you can, well, I think, I, I know there are things deep down in the VM that you can kind of tune. Um, but the, kind of the whole point is that, like, you get whatever, like, you get what you need. Like, the VM kind of gives you, and if it can't find it, Locally, it will go find it kind of up the tree, like the network tree, to wherever the stone is. Does the, uh, does the stone persist in plasma, which is the of the objects? Yes. So if I push an object into the stone and then later, later modify that plasma, I can say I add that do other instances pick up that new Would uh, Yes, other instances. So the question was, um, does maglev persist the class definition? So classes are objects, so it persists them. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so if you do add a method, it will get picked up. And there are strategies for like migrations, um, which haven't been thought about a lot in the in like the Ruby version, but in Smalltalk they kind of have that figured out. There hasn't been a lot of work done quite yet. Um, I don't. I don't know if we actually have more time. I mean, kind of have much time as we want because we're at lunch. Huh? Let's take a look. Yes. What version of Ruby does it run? So uh, Maglev right now runs 187. It runs most of 187, um, and uh, uh, they're working on 19 support right now. Yes. What about uh, reporting in um, this intelligent software off of the data that you've got persistent? So uh, the question was about reporting um, or data analysis. So um, there, there are things built into the VM itself that um, kind of give you a lot of like the analytics you might want. Um, but you know, you, you have objects and they're just there. So you could kind of like build up whatever type of reporting you want. And that's something that OOC, OOCL chose Gemstone um, back in like the 90s because you know they've got offices everywhere and they have each office has different reporting uh, requirements, and so it, it allowed them to, you know, do massive reporting stuff. Yes. Uh, so this is another scalability question. I guess, uh, so if you have, one of the great things about Redis is it doesn't care what language you write in. With this, it seems like, oh, now I have a JavaScript app or I have a Clojure app, and I talk to it and get, like, Ruby objects. It seems like, what are your things just learning from the past? I feel like we learned from so that passing around objects is exactly one of Right. So, um, uh, so the, the the I guess the statement was that you know Redis is cool because it's. So how do you integrate with other languages? Oh, how do you, so you don't? I mean, so the same thing you would right now. Like if you have a JavaScript app, but your backend is in Ruby, you're going to use JSON. So the same thing uh, in using Maglev essentially. Um, but the, the power is that if you need to um, build up some other component of your application in Ruby, you don't have to duplicate um, code. You don't have to, like, the objects are just there. Like, I, I know I kind of, like, wave my hand when I say that, but I swear to God, like, that's, that's how it works. Like, they're just, <laughs> they're just there. Like, it's great. And when you start playing with it, you'll see that. And, and hopefully it will blow your mind. Yes? Uh, yeah, sure. So the queue is something I, I one thing about the queue, um, I whipped it up in like five minutes, at, like before a talk. So it is not, um, it is not great. But it, yeah. yes. So, okay, I think that's it. Let's go to lunch. Thanks. <laughs>